For those of you that don't know me, um, my name's James Beckemer. Um, I'm a PhD student and part-time uh, lecturer at Charles Sturt University, and I also run a company called Spark Labs, uh, which makes applications written in Coca Python. Um, there were also two uh, Coca Python workshops recently, um, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne. Um, basically, this talk's a bit of a condensed, condensed uh, introduction from those workshops, and we'll just be briefly looking at some demos, not too much live coding, uh, though if you do have a laptop, you're welcome to um, uh, bang away while we go through some of the demos. So we're just going to touch on what Coca Python is, um, build up on some of the work from uh, Chris's previous talk, uh, have a look at uh, making completely native Coca apps in nothing but Python, um, some tips and tricks you'll run into making uh, Coca Python apps, um, what you need to consider uh, before distributing a Coca Python application to other users, and um, if we get time, a quick look at using Coca Python in websites. So, because DevWorld this year doesn't have a dedicated session for looking at what Coca is, I'm just going to really briefly touch on it in a couple of slides just so you've got an idea. So, Coca, from Apple's perspective, is an all encompassing term for the entire application environment um, on Mac OS X. So it's not just the frameworks that Coca provides, it's also the entire runtime environment and development environment, i.e. Xcode and Interface Builder. And as mentioned earlier, uh, it was originally developed by Next Computer with the name NextStep um, in the early 80s, in the early, uh, late 80s and early 90s. But from a Coca Python perspective, we're only going to consider it as a set of object-oriented classes that provide access to things like user interface, graphics, sound, and other uh, objects. We're not going to consider the uh, whole runtime environment. Um, but it allows us to access Coco, and while the frameworks are written in Objective-C, we don't need to know Objective-C to use them. And this is what the Coco Python bridge is. That's just a quick rundown on what most of the functionality the Coco frameworks provide. Um, by now, I'd say most people would have an idea of what they provide just by using other applications. So I'm not going to run into them, um, but uh, obviously you might want to have a read through that uh, at a later stage. But a really important point I need to make is Coco and Objective-C are not the same thing. A lot of people say they're programming in Coco when what they really mean is they're programming in Objective-C. But uh, Objective-C is just a language. It's not Coco. You don't need to know Objective-C to use Coco. So a good quote that sums this up um, is from the website listed there. And it's, at the end of the day, it's Coco that's a crown jewel, not the language in this case, Objective-C. So Coco provides excellent, excellent stuff under Mac OS X. Uh, just be aware that you don't need to use Objective-C to uh, use it. So as I said, um, Apple also considers Xcode and Interface Builder to be part of uh, Coco environment. Um, I'd say everyone knows what Xcode and Interface Builder are. Um, but if you don't, uh, Xcode provides project control, source control, source code editing, um, and is essentially just a graphical user interface to GCC for compiling and GDB for debugging. Uh, under Leopard, it comes with project templates for Objective-C, um, Python, and Ruby. So we'll be using the Python templates. Uh, interface Builder allows you to mock up an interface design without having to do it in code. Uh, menus, windows, buttons, controls can all be created without any code. Uh, it's also popular for prototyping. Um, even if you're not actually going to use what you've made an interface builder in a program, it's just good for mocking up a, a design to see if you want to use it. An interface builder can save in two formats, the newer zip format or the older nib format. Uh, Coca Python supports uh, using both, so that isn't an issue. So Python, what is it? Well, I know we've got a few people here that haven't coded in Python before, but essentially... Um, it's obviously a different language, uh, quite easy to pick up. It's actually a great uh, introductory language if you haven't coded before. Um, it has a very, very diverse set of libraries. So while Coca's uh, got a great set of frameworks, 
Python has its own great set of libraries, and this allows us to merge the two um, and get a lot of functionality. It's very scalable. It runs on almost anything, um, from Mac OS X to Windows um, to mobile phones, you name it. Um, and there's also a huge community. So there's tons and tons of third-party frameworks. It's very, very easy to find help if you run into any issues, even if it's Cocoa Python problems. And one of the more important things is it's actually got great cross-platform support. So you could write your program in Python and use uh, Cocoa Python to run under Mac OS X for a full native application. And you could use something like Iron Python, which is uh, basically the Windows equivalent of Cocoa Python, which is actually a wrapper for .NET under Windows. And uh, then you'll have a completely native uh, Windows program as well uh, using the same code base. So if for some reason you're wanting to write a tool or an application that's cross-platform, uh, consider Python for that as well. So what is Cocoa Python? Well, its real name is PyOBC, and PyOBC has been around for a long, long time. It's a very mature bridge between Objective-C and Python and has great support. Uh, it can be thought of as basically a fusion of the Python and Objective-C libraries. Uh, very flexible, allows very rapid development. Um, if you go to the Apple website and look at an interview with the um, developers of Checkout, a very, very popular um, application, um, they give Cocoa Python a really, really big wrap on how they're able to develop their application so much faster because they use Cocoa Python rather than raw Objective-C. Uh, it's fully Apple supported as of Leopard and it's supported under Snow Leopard. Um, and a lot of people just simply aren't a fan of the uh, Objective-C syntax. I really don't like square brackets and this is a way around it. So just to give a few examples, just in case if you're really wondering whether Cocos of Python is properly supported, well, Apple use it themselves. Um, under Leopard Server and Snow Leopard Server, they've got just there's one example, the calendar server. It's all written in Cocoa Python. So you know when Apple are eating their own dog food, um, it's going to be well supported into the future. As I mentioned before, Checkout's won a couple of Apple Design Awards. Uh, it's completely written in Cocoa Python. Um, it runs on Tiger Up. Um, it's really worth having a look at. It's just a fairly small download, 20 meg or something. But if you go and have a look and, and give it a bit of a run through, you'll see there's really no difference between the functionality of a, a Objective-C written application and a, an application written in Python. And just a bit of a shameless plug, that's a bit of an old screenshot, but uh, as I said, a lot of my experience in Cocoa Python comes from running my own applications. Uh, Viscosity is one of them, just a very, very simple open VPN client. Uh, but it's completely written in Cocoa Python with no real performance issues. Now, I'm not going to talk about the language today. Um, if you're interested, there's heaps and heaps of tutorials online. I don't really want to bore anyone um, <clears throat> into talking about Python syntax. But that's basically the 30-second summary. Uh, all you really need to know is in Python, indentating, um, indentation sorry, is forced. You have to do it. So whereas in uh, C, C++, Objective-C might define you know, a block of, of code with, or Java is the example, with uh, braces, um, you use indentation in uh, Python. So as we can see here, I've just defined a Python called my function. And I've said, hey, those three lines are part of my function because they're indented um, one step. So in that case, that's just a tab. You can use spaces instead if you want. And then I can see that that print statement is part of that if block because it's tabbed across one further. So a general rule there is if you've got a colon, um, you're going to want to tab, at the very least, the next line. So let's have a look at using Cocoa Python. So as I said, um, the templates are included um, in Xcode. Um, for a normal application, a core data application, a document based application, and so on. Um, you can use uh, Xcode's built-in organizer. I don't use it, but if you rely on it, it will work with Cocoa Python applications as well. And both Xcode and Interface Builder can track outlets and actions without a problem. So we'll touch on them if you haven't done Cocoa programming before um, a little bit later. So uh, creating a Cocoa Python uh, project in Xcode is very, really easy. Under Leopard, just go File, New Project, and under Applications, select Cocoa Python application. 
Now, as we saw earlier, uh, it's a little bit different under Snow Leopard because Apple actually removed the Cocoa Python templates and Ruby templates and so on. They said Xcode was getting a bit too cluttered. So don't interpret that as it's no longer supported. It still is. It just means you have to install the templates manually. Um, the proper way of doing that is to go to the official PyOBC website, and the address is listed there, grab them from the SVN, and uh, install them manually. But that's a lot of work. So what I've also done is package them up in an uh, <coughs> installer file, which you can download from that address, and just double click and run through the installer um, to install the um, templates into Xcode under uh, 10.6. And rather than being under the application section, they install into the user templates area. It just installs under your user profile. So instead of going to application, you'd select Cocoa Python in the user template section to the left, and then select what type of application you want. Now, Chris uh, did touch on this, um, but using the bridge is quite easy. So um, a general rule is replacing the colon UC and objective C code with underscores to get the Python equivalent. It's a little bit more complex than that if we look at that a bit more in depth. Um, <clears throat> in object oriented environments, when you're in, uh, calling a method, um, you're really uh, sending messages to an object. So in objective C, um, that's just a simple example there. So if we had an object called A object, and we wanted to call um, a method called do this with two arguments, arg1 and arg2. That's how we'd uh, do it in Objective-C. So you don't need an Objective-C, but if you're reading through the Apple documentation and they give an example, it's probably going to be in Objective-C. So you want a general idea on how to interpret um, Objective-C code. So just an example, um, in Objective-C, if we wanted to capitalize a string, um, and our string was called my string. That's how we do it. Square bracket, my string, which is the object, space, the method name, close square bracket, semicolon. So how do we convert that to something we can use in Python? Well, quite easy. Um, to get the message name, um, we simply take out the arguments and drop the object. So we're left with do this, colon, with this, colon. And we know the object was originally a object from the previous example. So. We simply replace the colons with underscores. So now we've got um, a name do this underscore with this underscore. So it's looking a bit messier, but that's what we've got. And we know we apply that to our target object, which is a object. And we've got two arguments. So now the equivalent in Python is now a object dot do this underscore with this underscore, and then pass the arguments like you would normal Python syntax. But you don't have to remember all that. Uh, Xcode auto-completes uh, most Cocoa uh, well, calls, framework calls. Uh, usually, you only have to type the first few letters, and it will, if it figures out what you want, it, as you can see there in that little screenshot, it will display it there for you. Or you can hit Escape, and it will bring up a list of all the uh, method names or class names you could be going for. So you really don't have to remember much um, converting from Objective-C syntax. And as you can see there is if you, especially for long function calls in Objective-C code, it can get a bit confusing because they split out all the arguments. Um, so if you go to the Apple documentation, you can see there uh, it's got the nice uh, message name with the columns right there. Um, and they're all listed like that in the Apple documentation. So simply replace the columns with underscores and then grab the, the parameters and you're done. You've got your equivalent. So let's have a look at um, using that in a real world example. So let's say we had an application called a currency converter um, that simply um, converts the currency given a given rate. Um, in Objective-C, we might have a class that we instantiate called converter. So we're uh, allocating the memory and then initializing it, and setting the currency amount, setting the rate, and then calling convert currency, which returns the converted amount. The equivalent in Python, as you can see, is quite easy to do. Uh, you'll see there's no underscores for things like alloc and init because there's no parameters. A general rule is you're almost always going to have one underscore per parameter. 
Uh, you can see when we set the source currency amount, there's a colon there, and then we're giving it a parameter. So instead, we're putting an underscore there, and then passing our parameter Python style. Same with set rate. And there's no arguments for convert currency, so we don't have to put any underscores there. So very, very simple. You'll be able to read each. You can go back and forth if for some reason you want to convert some of your Cocoa Python code back to Objective-C. It's, it's very, very easy to do. All right, demo one. Um, this isn't a code along demo. Um, basically, w this talk was given at DevWorld last year as well. And one of the other talks at DevWorld was uh, a core image example, uh, written in Objective-C, showing how it, easy it is to use Cocoa from Objective-C. So the challenge was on, of course, for the Cocoa Python talk to convert this to Python. So I didn't know anything about core image at the time. It took me about half an hour. Um, and basically, this is, I'll be making the code available for you to have a look through at the end of this talk um, if you're interested. But basically, I just want to show you the demo. Um, we won't look at too much code. Just to show you that, well, to prove really that um, Objective-C applications and Cocoa Python applications have the same functionality um, available. So if we run the Objective-C version, we'll see what this application is. We'll just uh, give it a second. All right, so this is just a core image. So basically, the cockroaches or bugs run away from the light and will randomly move around. So that's a fairly simple look at using uh, some of the cool Cocoa frameworks. And that's all written in Objective-C. So what about trying to write that in Python? Well, no big problem. We'll just build and go that. And we see here it is, the exact same application written entirely in Python. So that's an example you might want to have a look through. Um, but really all I did is follow that procedure before converting Objective-C calls to the equivalent in Python. There are a few little issues you can run into. Um, but I really encourage people to have a look at the source online. I'll list the address at the end of the talk. Um, I don't really expect people to go through the code, um, but that's just an example of some of the Objective-C code in that application. Um, as you can see, it's a bit messy, um, but a simple example is if you look at that, that third line, self.layer, add sublayer, etc., just a short line. If we have a look at the Python equivalent, you can see we haven't had to really do anything different than with our uh, currency converter example. Just simple converting from columns to underscores and passing parameters. Uh, Python style, no real headaches there. And then you've just converted an entire Objective-C application to Python. Now, you can't have, well, not easily, uh, have a Cocoa GUI application without knowing a little bit about Interface Builder and Outlets and Actions. So if you've never programmed in Cocoa before, um, there's two concepts. Outlets, which allow you to link two uh, objects in your GUI. So you can have an outlet pointing to a button, an outlet pointing to a text field, and it basically allows you to reference those text fields or whatever you're pointing to in your code. Actions, on the other hand, uh, work in the opposite direction. They allow you to receive user events. So if the user clicks on a button and you want to know about that, that's an action. So in Python, um, defining outlets and actions is very easy, and it's fully integrated with Interface Builder. So as an example there, defining outlets, you simply put them in your Python class at the top, so the static. And here I've defined one called window, and I just go window equals IB outlet. And then Interface Builder will automatically parse that source file, figure it out it's there, and then when we jump into Interface Builder, as I'll show you in a second, um, it knows everything about it. Likewise, defining an action, we just put a decorator there at IB ac action above the function we want Interface Builder to know about. So in this case, I'll just call it send message. Uh, there's one thing I'll point out there with actions is this is just standard Cocoa stuff. If you look at the Cocoa documentation, is one thing they accept is a sender. And because we're accepting a parameter, we have to do the opposite of our rule. Um, so Objective-C uh, code in Cocoa is going to be calling our function called send message. And as we're accepting a parameter, we have to add an underscore, because that would be a colon if we're calling Objective-C code. 
So let's have a look at building a really, really simple example. I'm going to just use that currency converter code from before and just make a really simple GUI um, so you can have a look at um, starting a simple Cocoa application in Python. Uh, you're welcome to code along for this demo if you want. Uh, we won't be going too quickly and it's not very complex. So I'll just get rid of that. So if you're on that Leopard, uh, you can just go File, New Project, and select Cocoa Python application. If you're on Snow Leopard, you're going to have to grab um, that installer file that I put online before um, to install the templates. And then we'll just save that called Demo2. Now if we build and run that, we should get an empty window. Um, one thing you'll notice there is when you hit build and go, um, Xcode isn't actually compiling your Python code. Python code is interpreted. Uh, what it's doing there is compiling some of the Objective-C wrapper code and then copying your Python source files in your application bundle. So there's not actually any compiling of your source code happening. And there's our empty window. But obviously, for a currency converter, we want uh, the user to be able to enter um, a few things. Actually, um, I think this demo was actually going to be a tip calculator rather than a currency converter with the same code. Um, so let's design a bit of a, a GUI around that. Okay. Yes? Are, are the um, Objective-C classes resolved at runtime? Yes, they are. So we've got our interface builder file here. If we double click on that to open it up, and here it is. And so this is just the default one created with any Cocoa application, same with raw Objective-C templates. So if we double click on that to open up the window, the low resolution is a little bit of a mess here. So I might make that a bit smaller. And we'll put some controls on there. So if you've never used Interface Builder before, if you go Window, sorry, Tools and Library, we'll bring up this library window, and we can drag some controls onto our window. So I might drag a label called meal cost and then drag a text field next to it that allows the user to enter the cost of the meal. So I'm just going to duplicate that um, to allow them to enter the amount they want to tip as well. We'll just have that as a percentage. And obviously we're going to need a button, so once they've entered that information, um, they can click the button. So I'll just put that there and call it calculate tip. And we'll want somewhere for it to display the amount they have to tip. Um, we could have an alert or something like that, um, but just for the sake of simplicity, let's just put a label down here. I'm just going to leave it saying label for now so we can easily see that it exists. So I'll just save that, and then I'll switch back to Xcode. Now the file we want to enter is the delegate Python file. That's just created as part of the template. Um, it's fairly standard to Cocoa, uh, Cocoa applications. I won't go through it, but the AUC will probably be running Cocoa Python workshops again. So if you are interested in, um, in more in-depth um, on what these things are, um, you're welcome to attend one of them. So that's just the default uh, template file. Basically what happens is when we run the application, that window will open up as it's set to open up in Interface Builder. And we'll get a string printed to the console saying application did finish launching. But what we want to do now is, as we saw in that code in the slide, we need some outlets so we can access what the user enters in our text fields and an action so we can find out when they click the button. So I'm going to have an outlet called meal cost. And I'm just going to go like that. I'm going to have another one for the tip field. And so we can write to that other um, text field I created, the result, the amount they have to tip. Now, there is a trick here in that Python doesn't know about IB outlets or IB actions until we import um, the Objective-C module. So at the top of our code, we just go, and that's letting our Python code know about um, some of the functionality the bridge provides. So we also want an action. So just below 
uh, application did finish launching, I'm going to add an action and I'm going to call it uh, calculate tip. Whoops, because we have a sender, we have to have an underscore. And for now, let's just check that this action will work. I'll just say button clicked. So NSLog is a function that um, the bridge provides that's in Objective-C code and just basically prints what you say to the console. So that will run, but that won't do anything yet because we actually have to link those in Interface Builder. So if we switch back to Interface Builder, we should still have our zip file open. And here's our delegate class listed down here. So we've been ending the code of that, and Interface Builder has it listed there. So it's got outlets and um, actions. Interface Builder will automatically parse them when we save the file. So we want to connect them. It's quite easy to do. You just hold down Control and click and drag. So for example, I've just clicked, held down Control, clicked and dragged from our del app delegate class to the mule cost field. And then I'm going to join that mule cost outlet we just created in Python. I can do the same with the tip field. And I can do the same with the result field. So that's dragging from the app delegate onto the control we want to link to that outlet. For actions, we simply do it the other way around. We're going to say, hey, button, when you fire your action, instead, go to the app delegate. So we control click on the button go to the app delegate and connect the calculate tip action. And then we can just save that. So now if we hit build and go, that's always a good sign. It's going to be tabs. Yes. Um, this is one trick that I always run into with demos. Um, the Xcode templates use spaces uh, for indentation, whereas I use tabs. Most people use tabs. You can edit the Xcode um, templates, but I find it just far easier just to tab things across. There is a, um, a trick where you can go, I think it's to the view or edit menu and say convert spaces to tabs, but for the sake of this, we should just be able to do that. And there's our window. So if we switch to the bug view, we'll have our console down here. That's where errors are also displayed. Um, Xcode, because uh, Python's interpreted, Xcode doesn't pick up any syntax areas at compile time. When you try and run your application, that would be displayed in the console. So we've got our application did finish launching message. message. Um, if we click calculate tip, we can see we've uh, successfully connected that action. We get the button clicked message. So now we just want to add um, our code to calculate that tip. So rather than boring everyone, um, I'm just going to copy and paste some nice pre-made code into that calculate tip function. I'll just describe what that's doing. So we're accessing the outlet. So I've got an outlet called mule cost up here. So I'm, as it's part of the class we're in, I'm going self dot mule cost. And then text fields have a nice um, method called float value that will return an, a numbered value as a float from that text field. It will throw an error if for some reason the user's entered non-floating point representation. Um, I can do the same thing with a tip percent, interpret it as a, a floating point number. Then I just do a simple uh, calculation to calculate the amount to tip. And then for our result text field, I'm going to say pay um, sub in the, the number they have to pay as a tip. And so for uh, text fields, there's a nice helper val uh, method called set string value where I can change the value of a text field. Because it accepts one argument, that's the new string, we've got to have an underscore there. So if I build and go that, and say our meal cost was 100, and our tip is 5, we can see uh, it changes the text field with the amount we have to tip. So that's just a very, very simple introduction to Coco programming. So what we've done with the Interface Builder is exactly the same as what you do in the Objective-C application. The only difference is we've defined some outlets and actions in Python, and we're interacting with those outlets and actions in Python. So I'll close 
that, and we can jump back to the slides. So as I said, that's a basic introduction, but there are um, issues you run into uh, with Cocoa Python when you're first starting out, and there's some uh, for the advanced users that are getting, will want to get stuck straight into it. Um, there are some tips you need to be aware of. Firstly, uh, multi-threading. With all our dual-core and quad-core computers, um, you'll probably want to take advantage of them um, using threads. <coughs> um, you can use um, Cocoa threads in Cocoa Python applications without a problem. You can also just use standard Python threads inside a Cocoa Python application, again, without a problem. Um, but one thing you need to be aware of is when you create your own thread, you have to create an NS auto release pool. Now, this is standard Cocoa programming behavior. Um, Cocoa Python automatically creates an NS auto release pool for your application. This just stores uh, memory allocated resources and releases them when they're no longer used. Um, so you don't have to worry about that 99% of the time. But if you create your own thread, as it runs separately, you have to create an NS auto release pool. So here's an example. I'm using Cocoa threads. So I'm creating a thread using Cocoa, and I'm saying, hey, thread, um, I want you to run the my thread um, method. So I'm just creating an NS thread, allocating the memory, and it's got a nice helper um, initialization method called init with target, the selector, and then the object. So I'm saying, hey, the target is me. Uh, what I want you to run is in self.mythread. As you can see, I've defined below, and we don't care about passing in any objects. And then I'm creating an NS auto release pool, which I'm just calling pool. Um, under Snow Leopard, uh, that is not quite right um, because um, there's a few changes to both the bridge and Objective C in Snow Leopard. Um, the NS auto release pool is going to try and automatically clean itself up. So instead of going pool.release, uh, you can go pool.drain or you can use Python syntax and go del space pool to delete the memory when you're done. If you don't, you'll have a memory leak. So there's the equivalent in Python. Um, most people, when they create threads in Python, um, will use a threading library. And it just uh, has a fixed function name called run, and we've got the exact same content in there. So both of those things will achieve the exact same purpose. You just need to be aware of NS auto release pools. Now, I won't really go into mixing Objective-C and Python code. Uh, because Chris um, was basically addressing that in his talk. Um, but you can mix Objective-C code and Python code in the same application uh, without a problem. Um, it's very, very easy to use your Objective-C classes that you've written in Objective-C and Python. So if you want to expand an Objective-C application or expand your Python application by adding Objective-C code, um, the bridge automatically takes care of that for you. All you have to do is have it in your Xcode project, and that's it. Python will know about it. Uh, it's a bit harder to go the other way. Um, Chris was addressing that, but basically you need to write a wrapper. Um, otherwise, it's very, very hard. Objective-C does not know about Python all that well. It doesn't have a nice fancy bridge. Um, so what you want to do is generally wrap your Python code uh, with the Cocoa Python um, objects, and that way uh, Objective-C can see it as a Objective-C class. So you can have a look at the slides later for a bit more information on that. Uh, that's, as Chris said, there's a few helper methods in Objective-C um, for seeing your class. Uh, I will touch on this, and that's using custom Objective-C frameworks uh, in your um, Python applications. So Growl is a popular third-party um, framework. There's going to be a Sparkle talk tomorrow. Um, these are all easy to use from a Cocoa Python application. Um, they just need to be loaded, and there's a helper um, function for that called load bundle, surprise, surprise, in the Objective-C uh, module, which we imported before. And that's just an example of how you do that with Growl. So I'm going, hey, this is the location to our Growl framework. Load it. Um, the Cocoa Python bridge automatically takes care of all the importing, and we have access to it straight away. So I'll just uh, give up bring up a bit of code um, for using Growl. This is an example. Um, you can obviously run whatever you want. Wait, we just did that. So 
So I won't type it out, because otherwise we'll run out of, it, out of time. Um, but in our delegate um, source code, just like we were editing before, as we saw in the slides, I'm loading the Growl framework path. Now, if you've done Coca before, you'll know there's a helper uh, class called NS Bundle. So instead of having to pass the full path to wherever I've got the Growl framework, assuming I've copied it in my application, I can just go, hey, NS Bundle, grab the main bundle, that's the application bundle, and tell me the full path to where the frameworks are. So that's just an easy way to load the Growl framework. Then I'm just calling Objective-C load bundle. It's loading it in. I'm giving it the base class name. Objective-C doesn't really uh, care too much if you give it a different name, as it automatically parses it and pulls it in, and just the path to where that framework is. And then as part of Growl, it requires a delegate, so it can let you know about things that are, uh, are happening and grab data from you. And two of the things it requires is a registration dictionary. In Growl, it just wants your application name and what notifications you're going to give it. And there's also another uh, one called application name. Um, that's not compulsory, but I just threw it in there. And this is how we can display a message. So I'm just giving a title, description, and the name we gave it up there. And as you can see, some long function names get horribly, horribly messy um, in Cocoa Python with all the underscores throwing it all together. So here I'm going, uh, hey, Grail Application Bridge, display that message. And as we can see, it's incredibly long, um, but that's all just documented. So if we were to build and go this application, here's a simple example. And when I click Grail Message, that's essentially what Grail does, display notifications for you. So it's in a lot of third-party applications. Adium's a big example of it. And uh, if you are building commercial apps, you might want to throw in something like Growl. So that's just a simple example of how you could go about using it, just with a few lines of code. Now, this was a popular example in the Cocoa Python workshops, given at the start of this month and late last month. Um, basically, um, we just wanted to work on something from scratch um, and have a little bit of fun with it. So we came up with a Bluetooth uh, device fish tank. So we're using Bluetooth on our computer um, from nothing but Cocoa Python. We wanted to scan the area for Bluetooth devices, get the name, if we can, of any Bluetooth devices found, um, draw the name and a simple little icon to our screen, and have them moving around randomly, a bit like um, you were looking at a fish tank of Bluetooth devices. And that's just an example of what I looked at, I think, in the Melbourne workshop um, of the moving around. So I'm just going to show you a bit of code on how you could achieve this. So what's the first step you want to do? If you're writing, this is basically what you'd start doing if you wanted to write an application right now. So you've had your idea. The first step is going to be documentation. So how the hell do I scan for Bluetooth devices? So I pull up the documentation in Xcode and search for you know, Bluetooth scanning and things along those lines. And hey, what do you know? There's a uh, class called IO Bluetooth Device Inquiry. Great. But it wants a delegate. So it can let you know when it defines a device. So hey, we're going to have to implement a delegate too. No problem. So what do we have to implement to have a delegate? Well, thankfully, in the documentation, we can see it defines here a protocol for IO Bluetooth Device Inquiry Delegate. Um, and there's a few uh, methods it lists. Um, they're all optional. So you can find out when a scan's complete, uh, when a device is found, you know, when it started, all those type of things. So we'll implement a couple of them um, so we can know what's going on. So I'm not going to start this from scratch. Obviously, this was, took several hours in um, a two-day workshop. So I'm just going to pull up the complete code and point out a few particular uh, points. I might turn on Bluetooth on my phone. Now, there's no error checking happening in here, um, as it's just a simple example. Um, so if you don't have Bluetooth turned on, it will crash and die horribly. So in a real application, you obviously want to check whether your laptop has Bluetooth turned on or not. Um, but if I just make it so my phone is visible, and hit Build and Go, hopefully it works. So there we go. That's my phone. 
So it's just doing a scan. I think every there's something else every 15 seconds or something on those lines of Bluetooth devices in range. So we're just using simple uh, Coco drawing graphics to draw it to an NS view uh, inside the window, and then moving it around and a few things like that. Oh, there's something else. Um, at least they're all G-rated. Uh, we had some interesting names in the workshops. It actually took me, in the screenshot and the slides, a, a few goes to uh, get one without any uh, profanity listed in the machine names. Um, so let's have a look at some of the code behind that. And once again, this will all be online for you to go through. I'll list the address at the end of the talk. Um, so we've got our application delegate over here. And once again, this is the first class that's called uh, when you start your application. And so there's a few things I've created. I've created a class called Bluetooth Scanner in Cocoa Python. So I'm basically creating that and then starting a scan. And I'm creating a timer, and I'm using Cocoa Timers here, to redo a scan every 10 seconds it appears. And I'm also creating a second timer uh, that runs every 0.01 of a second to update the drawing. So it looks like things are moving around. And they're just getting called by the timer. So scan update and, um, and things on those lines. And I should really be doing that with both timers, but when the window close, closes, I'm killing the timers. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is the scanning code. Now, when you look at the documentation, you'll find out that uh, all the Bluetooth functionality that Mac OS X provides is actually in this framework file here, which resides in system library frameworks and it's called iobluetooth.framework. So just Coke and Python won't know anything about it. But as we saw with Graal, we can just pretend it's a third-party framework and just tell um, the Coke and Python about it. So we can just do our same load bundle. We don't need any fancy calls because it's always going to be in the same place on everyone's machine because it's part of the operating system. So basically, once I've told Coca Python about it and knows about it, and as we saw from the documentation, I'm creating it. That's just one of the functions in documentation. I'm saying, hey, scan for five seconds and start scanning. And I've implemented two of those um, delegate methods we saw before. So I know when a scan is started, because that delegate method will get called. And this delegate gets called as soon as the device is found. So initially here, I was just printing out the device found and getting the name. And that's just a helper method that is in the framework. If you can't get the name, it just displays the address. And But because we're drawing fish tank, I'm instead going, hey, tank view, which is another Cocoa Python class. Um, display our fish on screen. And then over here is some drawing code. This is moving code for the fish. Um, sorry, and down here we have our view. And this handles our drawing code. So uh, once again for Coco, drawing to a view is very, very easy. You just implement your drawing code, Coco drawing code inside the draw rect uh, method. And um, here, this is where I'm drawing it. I've just got example, uh, so a simple example in some comments there of if you just want to draw random points around. Um, so I'll put all that code online for you to go through at your leisure. Um, but it's just showing that you have the full power of uh, Cocoa from Cocoa Python. So if we jump back to the slides. All right, so a few tips uh, for packaging your application. Now. With Objective-C, most of the time, you'll just hit build and you know, put your application to DMG and start giving it out to your users. Um, you can do that with your Cocoa Python application as well, but typically, you won't want to treat it quite that simply. There's a few considerations. One, whether you want to make your source code available to everyone. Two, whether you've used any third-party Python modules. And three, how backwards compatible you want your application to be. So as I mentioned before, when you hit build and go in Xcode, it's not compiling your Python code. So we're used to giving someone, when we've written in Objective-C, an application, and they get a binary copy, and they can't look at your source code, which is great for commercial applications. Um, but that doesn't happen for Cocoa Python applications. 
Uh, what it's doing is, in fact, copying your Python source files into the application bundle and then telling Python um, to run them. So all a user has to do to see your source code is right-click on your application and go show package contents, and voila, they can see all your source code. And if yours happens to be a commercial application, they can just change what they want, and that all that registration information you need, they can just comment out, and voila. So it's great for open source applications, um, but not so great for commercial applications. So uh, if for some reason you're running a commercial application, um, what you want to do is distribute Python bytecode compiled files instead. Now, that's not to say you can't reverse a, a bytecode uh, byte code compiled file, a .pyc file, back to Python. Uh, you can get decompilers, just like you can for uh, Objective-C binary applications. Um, but it does make it a lot harder for someone to get access to your source code, and I'll never see the real deal. Um, so the easiest way um, to do that um, is to run your application once. Um, Python automatically uh, translates .py uh, source files to uh, .pyc files. So as we can see here, if I had an application called My Python App, I ran it once, and then right-clicked and went Show Package Contents and had a look at the Resources folder, I'd see that. So what we can do then is just delete the .py files. Your application will run fine off .pyc files. Um, and that way you can distribute it knowing you're not distributing the source code with your application. But that's kind of horrible. And that's not the way I do it with viscosity because that would be a pain. Every time you hit build and like for um, early releases, you'd have to go through and delete all the files and become a real pain. A better way to do it is write a build script in Xcode um, that goes through and just compiles everything, all the .py files, the .pyc files in your resources directory when your application is building, and it deletes the .py files. So that's not the nicest example. Uh, just a simple example, though. Um, Python includes a compile all module. It also includes a, a py compile module. So you can just write a Python build script in Xcode to go through and do that for you. And that way, it's all done automatically. And I've got a few examples online of that. The other issue I mentioned uh, is third-party Python modules. Um, so if you use the inbuilt Python modules, no problem. They're on every Mac OS X machine. Python's inbuilt um, on pretty much every Mac OS X version. Uh, but third-party modules aren't. So if you've downloaded some um, third-party module from the web and are using some funky feature it provides in your Python, uh, Cocoa Python app and then give it to someone else, unless they've installed that third-party Python module as well, their, your application won't run. But Python's smart. It will just look um, at your application's resource folder, the working directory, um, for where this module might be. So what you can simply do is you could either, once you've built your application, you could just manually copy and paste that um, third-party Python module into your resources folder. Or you can uh, set up a new build phase in Xcode uh, called copy files and have Xcode automatically copy those third-party modules into your Cocoa Python app. Now, this is a bit of a big one, uh, backwards compatibility. To be honest, if you're writing Cocoa Python applications, forget about Tiger and anything before it. Just go Leopard and Snow Leopard and anything that comes later. Uh, but if for some reason you really, really have to have Tiger and previous compatibility, you're going to have to go back to PyBC 1.4. So Leopard comes with PyBC 2.0. Um, Snow Leopard comes with, I think, PyBC 2.0 and 2.1, I think. Um, it's supposed to be getting backported to Tiger, but I sincerely doubt it'll actually get completed, at least in a relevant time frame. Um, so you can actually download PyBC 1.4 from the PyBC website and use it that way. Um, but you'll want to use a 10.4 machine for development. It does not run nicely on, um, on Leopard. Now, I'm just going to put some uh, sample code um, uh, online instead of actually running through this in the slides simply because we don't have a lot of time. This is just here in case we flew through it. Um, but you need to be aware that you can use Cocoa in um, websites as well. So if you've got some fancy image processing you want to do in a website where the user can upload an image or something like that, um, you can have fancy Python scripts to do that for you. So you're welcome to read through this at your leisure after the talk but I won't run through the demo. So basically, everything you've seen here today, um, all the Cocoa stuff, you'll see at other sessions um, here and tomorrow, uh, can be done 
using CocoPython. So just because the examples I've shown you as Injective-C doesn't mean you can't do it in CocoPython, just remember the rule, replace columns with underscores, and uh, you should be good to go. Um, I'll be putting all the slides and source code online at that address if you want to jot it down. Um, I imagine the AUC will also be putting up a video version uh, and, and or an audio version um, when they get the chance from the AUC website. Um, but it might be faster just to grab the code from there because I'll be putting that up today. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to ask them now or you can email them to me later or you can catch me anytime during DevWorld. So thanks very much. Uh, no worries. What's that? What about them? You'd have to run a, you'd have to write a wrapper to the C function Objective C, or a Python plugin. So Python Python works well with raw C quite easily, but if it's in you can't, but you know, if you've got a .c file and you just drag in an Xcode, Python's not going to know about it unless you so put a wrap around it. You don't want to write a, um, a thing for, say, um, the C functions. You could still use the Objective C in its operation, in its operation queue to say, get yes. it to GCD. Yes, cool. you could do that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I mean, yeah, so that's one way of doing it. So. I must admit that I'm a bit lazier. I mean, I don't use a lot of C in my applications, but the lazy approach I take is if it's an example of a class in Objective-C, and I'm like, I don't want to port that to Python. Uh, that's, I'm just too lazy for that. You can just drag it straight in Xcode, and Python knows about it. You're like, uh, you know. <laughs>